Whenever I'm reading a book, I do this thing where I write down any interesting words that I've found, any intriguing words in a notebook. Then later on, I'll sit at my computer and I'll look up the words in order to find out the interesting etymology and the definitions behind them. Well, then I decided that the second part of that process, the looking up words part, should be a show. So, welcome to Define, the boringest show on YouTube, right here at the Launchpad Writers Club. Cheers. Welcome back to the Launchpad Writers Club. My name's Andrew Lewis. This is another episode of Define, the boringest show on all of YouTube. Watch it while you do something better. Now, those of you who have subscribed will hopefully have noticed that we've added a new uh, playlist on our channel that we're building, a new show. Uh, so we've got Define, you know, that's, that's this one you're watching now. Now we've added a second show, which is interviews with creative people. We've only done two so far, but we're gonna keep adding to that and hopefully we'll have this catalog of really interesting conversations with really interesting and creative people. Now the style of this new show is meant to be a bit like a video podcast. So they're nice long episodes. The first two interviews go for an hour each, which means they're not just interviews like we ask questions, they answer the question. It's more like a conversation where we really get involved in a topic which is, I quite like that in an interview. I like that long form podcast style thing. If you haven't already, have a look. They're pretty entertaining. So our first word comes from the interview we did with Robbie Verhagen. We took that chance to ask him what his favorite word is. And he said, syzygy. Syzygy, it's a cool word. Um, the alignment of three celestial bodies. Syzygy. Syzygy. Yeah. In astronomy, a syzygy is a straight line configuration of three celestial bodies in a gravitational system. Celestial meaning positioned in or relating to the sky or outer space. So a thing that exists in space, a star, a planet, a moon. There's probably other things. Now I didn't realize it meant in a gravitational system. So that means the things that are aligning have to be within one you know, within, they're all within the solar system, the gravitational field of the sun. It also says a pair of connected or corresponding things. Now, the reason it, when it's not talking about celestial bodies is it can be two things, is I think because if you look at the etymology of the word, it means yoked or paired together. So if yoked, let's look up yoked. So the yoke is the thing that makes cattle tethered together. Um, you know, aligned together like this. Right, that's a pair of things aligned. But I guess when you're talking about celestial bodies, if you've got two, any two celestial bodies, you can draw a straight line between them, no matter where they are. So they're always aligned in a way, relative to each other. So you need that third one to say they're aligned in a straight line between the three. I do wonder if you can have four celestial bodies aligned and that would still be syzygy. Alignment of four celestial bodies. A quick search reveals that I can't be bothered actually finding out because it's not apparent. I've seen syzygy used as well <clears throat> as a sort of literary thing to mean like, you know how they say the planets all aligned as in like the circumstances all came together to allow something significant to happen. Kind of like coincidence and syzygy can be sometimes used as a word like that. I don't have an example of that, but I'm pretty sure I used it in one of my stories once to say like a syzygy of circumstances or something like that. It's a nice word. It's a very nice word. Well done, Robbie Verhagen. Shall we write it down? I'm just gonna write the astronomy definition, I think. The alignment of three celestial Bodies. You know I'm getting lazy when I write the letter three instead of the word. <laughs> lazy already, I'm on the first word. <sighs> I need a break. Mm. If you're all in America watching right now, <clears throat> do you know what cordial is? Just curious. Okay. <laughs> Next word. What am I doing? Ergodic. <clears throat> Ergodic. Relating to or denoting systems or processes with the property that given sufficient time they include or impinge on all points in a given space and can be represented, represented statistically by a reasonably large selection of points. Did you get all that? <laughs> so it's a mathematical, uh, not a law, because I don't know if it's a proven thing. I think it's like a theory. But it means if, so if a system goes on long enough, 
or infinitely, it will pass through all possible states of that system. They say that the universe is not ergodic, even though the universe is, um, well, infinitely long, if it is, it will, does not mean that everything that could ever happen will happen. I think what it means is that a loop can happen, the ticking of a weight, uh, and it can tick infinitely without ever changing its course. Uh, just because time will go forever doesn't mean that every single thing that could happen will have to happen. Uh, ergodic is the opposite. It implies that a long enough amount of time will allow for every single thing to happen. It's that thing you hear about when they say, you know, if, if a monkey typed on a typewriter for infinity, eventually in their babble they would write the entire works of Shakespeare. Uh, that's the theory, but then it's not provable because you could also say, well, they might just write infinite babble, which makes no sense. <sighs> I've chosen some hard words today. I, I wanted a bit of a challenge. Um, how do I make that more succinct and condense it? Mm -mm. In enough time, everything possible will happen. Now, if you're a mathematician or a physicist or anything like that and you're watching this, I apologize for how incorrect that is, but that's my uh, stupid literary brain trying to make a mathematical physics thing into something literary. I'm stupid. Okay. Next word, because that one, I'm shying away from that one. Although I'm, I'm shying away from that one and straight into Archi me D N Fulcrum Archimedean Fulcrum I spelt it wrong Archimedean Fulcrum or the Archimedean Point No, that's not it Oh, I just realised that I've t spelt that wrong in my book That's an E Archimedean Fulcrum um, now, I've typed that in and I'm not getting the results I want. What I want is the lever thing. All right, so what it is is a reference to the quote from Archimedes saying, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it and I shall move the word. First of all, what does fulcrum mean? The point on which a lever rests or is supported and on which it pivots. So it's the, you've got a lever that goes like that and it sits on something this bit, the bit that it pivots on, it's the pivot point of a lever. <laughs> I'm really bad at explaining things. Here we go, there's Archimedes himself with a really long lever moving the world. But if you sort of think about the function of each different uh, part of this little setup, the fulcrum is the sort of foundation, the necessary foundation for the lever of change. So Archimedes wasn't really talking about philosophy or anything like that. It was a mathematical thing. That's what I'm getting from this. But I don't know. I like it, again, as a literary device. I'm not going to really break down the different sort of metaphors you could pull out of that literary metaphors, but it just seems like something that you could really rip apart and use for, I don't know, like science fiction metaphors or something like that. Like the pivot point of change, he's said, you know, give me a lever and a place to stand and I will move the earth. I don't know, it's kind of like he wants to change the world, but he's still asking you to provide him with the kind of things he needs to do it. So it's, I don't know, what am I talking about? Definition. The foundation of the <coughs> lever change to move the world. Getting deep here. Getting deep. Right. Again, if you're a math mathematician or a statistician or a physicist or a Newtonian, anything like that, my most sincere apologies. Last word. I'm only doing four words today. Quixotic. Quixotic. That is a cool word. I love this one. Let's look it up. 
Quixotic. Quixotic. Extremely idealistic, unrealistic, and impractical. Starry-eyed, romantic, visionary, utopian, perfectionist, etc. Now, the cool thing about Quixotic is the etymology, it comes from the word Quixote, as in Don Quixote, as in the novel. The first ever modern novel, some would argue. Um, Don Quixote, written by none other than Miguel de Cervantes. Yes, I did just have to read that because I wasn't sure. Um, but the character of Don Quixote is really cool. So he's super naive and he sets off on this mission, but he's super optimistic and idealistic, unrealistically idealistic and optimistic. Um, but he maintains this optimism throughout his journey and that's kind of his charm. Uh, he ends up fighting a windmill, there's some donkeys involved. I don't really know. I'm not that familiar with the story. <laughs> I do really love this word though because it kind of pertains to the, um, the attitude of someone setting out on a quest and that optimism that would go with, some, with that. It's a great word to describe a new artist as well, uh, like a, a green artist that, um, you know, someone writing their first novel is often so ambitious and idealistic that, I don't know, it's obviously something that fades as an artist progresses through their career because they start to see the realism within the industry and within the profession. Even if they do achieve the success they're looking for, it's just natural that it, it fades to be normalcy rather than like, I'm going to go on this quest. Have you ever heard the saying, It's a, I think it's a British saying, start as you mean to go on? I think it's British because there was this time when I went to a pub with this British friend of mine and she cheersed me with her beer. I said cheers and she said, start as you mean to go on. And then she started drinking a beer. But that stuck with me, like, start as you mean to go on. Like, carry that ambitious, quixotic energy that you start off on a journey with right through to the end. Don't get disheartened, you know. Don't get derailed when something doesn't quite go right. Don't sort of lose faith when it takes longer to achieve your goal than you thought it would or when it takes a dark twist or something like that. Um, it's, it's just a cool word. Actually, when I came up with the name Launchpad, the first word that I started with was Quixotic. And I wanted something that implied the start of motion, like it was the catalyst for forward momentum and forward momentum in an optimistic fashion. And that was Quixotic was the starting point for me. Like I wanted to capture the kind of energy of that word. Uh, and it, it went through various different words. It was called onwards for a while, the onwards program. Um, like when someone sort of says onwards, you know. Um, there was something about a runway as well. Like, um, you know, that guy that, that says to the airplanes, like military airplanes, like go forward. That guy with like the headset thing. Actually, I'm gonna show you an old an old version of the logo. Here we go, here's the original logo for Launchpad. <laughs> and then I landed on Launchpad as the name of the writing club because it kind of went in line with the parent company being Up and Up Media. So you're launching and then you're going up and up into, you know, I don't know, it kind of just fell into place for me. That was the original logo. And then what happened is the rocket on the logo kept getting um, misinterpreted as a missile which is kind of the opposite message. Like I wanted a rocket ship going to explore space. You know, it's, it's the catalyst, the launching of this thing, an exploration vehicle for humans to go up and interpret infinite space and, and find meaning amongst all that universe. Um, but then people thought it was a missile going to destroy another country. So that was version 1.0 of the Launchpad logo. And now it is with what I hope is a bit more apparently not a missile going to destroy another nation, but a rocket ship sending explorers into space. So that is the story of how Quixotic ended up being Launchpad. I'm sure you did not enjoy that. Okay, so what am I writing here? Quixotic. Um, extremely idealistic. Unrealistic. And impractical. And I'm going to write the etymology because I think it's a pretty important part of this word. From Quixote. You know, the best example that you might have experienced of someone being quixotic, uh, if you've ever done a creative project, like uh, made a short film or something, 
and then it'll always be one of the actors will be like, you know, we should get um, Jeffrey Rush in to do this. We'll, we'll send him an email, see if he's keen. Uh, if we apply for a grant from the Victorian Film Institute, we can probably pay him 20 grand. Um, that would be great. And then rather than the other person, what we could do is have a CGI version, a computer generated image, like an animation of like an anglerfish with the light and it can be ta they can be talking together and that would be so much better. And you're kind of like, yep, that would be better. Um, but that's a little, like, I like your enthusiasm and I love that you want to do the best thing possible, but that person's being overly quixotic. Like, they just want to, they're too ambitious. They're too uh, idealistic. Like, let's do the greatest thing possible. It's something to be envied, but it's also something that, you, you, as someone who directs other artists, you're always finding yourself reining it in. You know, you're always telling that person, like, that's a great idea, but let's stick to the original one. It's, you know, it's quite, it's not as exciting as yours, sure, but uh, it's something we can film here and now today and get it done, get it over with. It's one of those funny things about art is you, uh, sometimes you've got to scale it back. Question is, which is better? More quixotic, more realistic. I think that's it for this episode. Thanks for watching. Um, I hope you learned something. If you did learn something, please do a fact check on that thing that you learned because uh, all this math stuff we talked about today, I actually have no idea what I'm talking about. Cool. All right, join us next time. See you then.